Thank you, Nancy. Well, in line with um, pretty much the way I've been preaching these last month or so, uh, we're going to, today is an experiment like it has been uh, for the last six or eight sermons, um, because uh, the Holy Spirit, I felt, uh, didn't want me to prepare in my normal way. Uh, I read chapter 8. Uh, is it, what, what chapter is this? 8, yep. Read chapter 8. I hope everybody read it. And I found out that the, the subject matter of chapter 8 is compassion. The whole chapter is about compassion. It's about God's compassion. It's about Jesus' compassion. It's about the early church's compassion. And we've talked about compassion so much in the past that that's why it was probably uh, too difficult uh, for me to actually come up with a, a research type sermon like I normally do. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start off with our key idea. And the key idea for chapter 8 is I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to people in need. Show compassion to people in need. Now, as you know, if you've been following the book, if you've been studious and actually reading each one of these chapters, you'll know that each chapter has a key idea, and it also has a key verse. Today's key verse is from Psalms, the 82nd Psalm, verses 3 through 4. It said, Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Pretty much that sums up compassion. Uh, we talk about it over and over and over again. This time I thought what I would do is I'd actually look it up in the dictionary and see what Webster had to say about compassion. Compassion is the sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. Now it's interesting because that definition kind of threw me off. So what I did is I looked at other dictionaries and I looked at other sources to give me a definition of compassion. And every single source that I looked at, it talked about the person receiving the compassion being in distress. Distress of some type or the other. That distress, as we all know, can run an absolutely huge gambit. It can run from the imagined to the, the poor man we were just talking about uh, earlier that only has a few uh, months to live or a short time to live. The gambit is wide. But the thing about the gambit is each and every single one of us fit into it someplace. Each and every single one of us is distressed over something. It may be something very, very light. It may be something uh, like I am in perfect health. Uh, life is good. And I just feel bummed out today. That's distress. It's, an import it's important for you to recognize that that's distress. And it's important even more for you to recognize that every single person has distress in their lives usually every day at some point during the day and I make this big point I, I, I point this out to you because it's important for you to understand that when you deal with other people understand that they have distress in their life. They have stress in their life. They have problems in their life. They have everything that would fit into that d definition right there. And it's your desire, if you're compassionate, it's your desire to alleviate it. Now notice it says it's your desire to alleviate it. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful. But you have it in your heart. This is the movement in your heart that says, I would love that person 
not to feel this distress. I would love that person not to be going through this. I would love that person not to have this problem. That is simply your desire. Now, a lot of people ask, what is compassion and how is compassion compared to love? God tells us to love every single person. I will tell you today that an even better definition of compassion is that it is a type of love. It is the ultimate type of love. Now that you know what the definition is, now that you know how you're supposed to feel in order to have compassion, you can look and see, you can walk into Walmart and you can see somebody that you've never seen before in your life. And you can know that God wants you to love that person. That God wants you to see Jesus Christ in that person. And what these first two steps do, these first two steps allow you to give that person if you were to get to know him, the benefit of the doubt. Because once you get to know a person, look at all of our friends, look at all the people who we know. So very many times, they make wrong choices in our eyes. We think they're messing up. We think they could be doing this better or they could be doing that better. It doesn't make any difference who, you, who we're talking about. We could be talking about your husband. We could be talking about your wife. We could be talking about your kids. We could be talking about your neighbors. But always, the people you know in your life could be doing better because that's the way the human psyche works. That's the mind that God gave us. And thankfully, he gave us words like compassion, which is the ultimate type of love to counterbalance all those feelings that we have, all those negative feelings. Compassion is to take that person once you've determined that you've loved him, and you don't know him from Adam, once you've you see Jesus Christ in that person. You haven't even said word one to him yet. Compassion is then the word that comes into play. It's the elevated love that comes into play should you get to know that person and find out what his problems are, what her problems are. Then you have this deep desire within your heart to alleviate those problems then you've added compassion, the highest form of love, to that person. Now, Jesus gave this absolutely wonderful story. It's called the Parable of the Good Samaritan. And I've read it to you a gazillion times, so I didn't put it up here. Uh, but if you don't know, have not read this parable, please read it. It's Luke 10, 25 through 37. But I'll just synopsize it for you by saying that a... Uh, <coughs> Jewish man was walking down the road and he was assaulted, this is in the time of Jesus, by bandits and he was beaten up almost to death and, all, and everything that he had was stolen and then he, he was just left there and a priest walked by and the priest didn't want to get involved with him. Does that mean the priest didn't love him? No, the priest may well have loved him but he had no compassion for him. He had no desire to help him. So the priest went on the other side of the road and kept on going and then a temple assistant kind of like a priest he comes by and he feels the same way toward this guy yes I might I might even love him uh, I might even feel bad for this guy but I have no desire to help him so he walks on the other side of the road and then a despised Samaritan comes along and this despised Samaritan, who is basically an enemy to the Jew that's laying there all beaten up, the Samaritan has compassion. 
the Samaritan has the desire. So he, he doctors him up the best he can. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to an inn uh, where he takes care of him for the rest of the day. And then he, he knows the guy's not going to be better today. So he gives the innkeeper money to continue his care. And it, end, it ends in Jesus asking a, uh, a person, uh, who would you say your neighbor is? But here's the deal. As beautiful as that story is, as absolutely wonderful and, and heart-wrenching that it is, and as much as it was used as an example to us, Here's the problem with the story. The problem with the story is out here in the country, we don't run across too many people laying on the side of the road that are beaten up. Maybe if you lived in the inner city, you might see that now and again. But out here in Boone Grove, or even in Valparaiso, you're not going to see too many people laying on the side of the road. So the question becomes then, how does God want, how did Jesus want us to equate this story, this wonderful story, to our lives, to the lives of people who aren't going to run across an enemy laying on the side of the road, if ever? And I think that's exactly what God wants us to talk about today. I think that's the type of compassion that God wants us to learn today. The little compassions. The little compassions that come along that we can do constantly to alleviate not necessarily somebody else's pain, not necessarily somebody else's condition, but we can alleviate that sadness that is in that person for even a second, for even a minute. Or maybe we might change that person's entire day. I told you before that uh, we celebrated or said goodbye uh, to Tom on Tuesday. Tom had a granddaughter. I don't know if you've, if you've ever seen her. Uh, her name is Ashley. Ashley is 21 years old and got a great-grandson, Matthew. Uh, but anyway, I knew ahead of time that Ashley was going to read a poem uh, that she had written. And when I sat back, I said to myself, as she's reading this poem, she must have run out of time writing this poem, and she must have got this puppy off the internet, because this is a good poem. I was impressed. I'm going to read, I brought the poem, and I want to read it to you. This was what she wrote about uh, her grandfather. A father, a brother, and a son. His pain and his suffering is now over and done. Trains and tractors were his entire life. With the woman who stood beside him, we call her his wife. From falling in love and raising a family of his own, having two sons to teach woodworking and tell all that he has shown. From the stories to baking and the train making, God knew that it was time, but warned we would have some heartbreaking. He knew we would miss him picking on us and the smiles he gave us, but God knew he must. He must bring our time home to a place so peaceful and bright, so we can be free of pain, so he can be free of pain in the brightest of lights. We cry out of love, not out of hate, because how can we hate the ones God creates. When we look into the sky with tears in our eyes, remember the good things when we say our goodbyes. No more suffering and no more pain. It's not goodbye. It's see you again. I was just flabbergasted at this young girl's talent. 21 years old, I'd known her for a number of years, I had no idea she had this talent. 
But that's the first aspect of compassion that I want you to understand. Ashley, 21 years old, doesn't understand hardly anything about life yet. But she's learning quickly. She used her compassion to bring comfort to others. She used her talent to bring that compassion to others. I don't know what your talents are. Many of you I do, but you have talents. You have things in you that God gave you, gifts. Use them to bring compassion to others, just like Ashley used hers to write that poem. I understand she's wrote a number of poems for events, like funerals and weddings and that sort of thing. She's using her talent. My question is, are you using your talents? Compassion is like a boomerang. I want to tell you a little story about a girl that I know. Uh, her name is Natalie Grimm. Natalie, I knew when we were members of the First Christian Church in Valpo. And I had watched Natalie grow up from a little girl. And Natalie has since graduated from high school and gone off to college. And she came back the other day. And Natalie and I are friends on Facebook. Me, you know, I, we're not tight or anything like that. We're friends, okay? She knows me. I know her. I've watched her grow up, all that sort of thing. Not like we have conversations with one another. But I so enjoy reading my friends, what the, the comments that they put on Facebook and the stories that they share. Natalie shared a story the other day. She said that... Uh, she, I, I, I'll tell you first that a week before this, she put a post on Facebook saying that I'm home for the summer. Uh, if you need a babysitter, if you need a dog sitter, if you need a dog walker, blah, 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 I'm available. So Natalie doesn't have a lot of money. And she does whatever is necessary in order to get by. Well, she said in her post, she said, Sunday I decided after church I was going to go to Chili Bowl because that's, Chili Bowl after church used to be something my grandfather did with the family. And I felt like this would be really cool. So she took herself to Chili Bowl after church. And she sees in the corner of her eye, she's sitting there eating, and she sees in the corner of her eye two police officers back there. And she's always had this soft spot in her heart for public servants, police officers, firemen, paramedics, EMTs, the whole, yeah, all of them. She's always had this soft spot in her heart, so she told her waitress, give me their check, and I'll take care of their check, and on the way out. And... This little girl who's in college, who doesn't got two cents to rub together, she gets the check and she walks up to the um, uh, cashier to pay it. And she looks back and she sees this police officer waving her back there. Now she's really embarrassed because this is supposed to be anonymous and her face gets all red, but she walks back there to this guy. She'd never seen these guys before. They weren't even Porter County. They were county officers from another county. And she says, I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be anonymous, and I'm really kind of embarrassed. And, and, and the guy said, you know, I've been a police officer for over 30 years and a detective for a number of those, and you were easy to pick out, so don't be embarrassed. So, so anyway, she's standing there and she's talking to this guy. She has no idea in the world who he is. And he picks up his telephone, and he, he's going through his pictures, and he shows her a picture that he has, and it's a picture of him in his uniform on his um, New York Police Department ID. This guy used to be belong to the New York Police Department for like eight years or something like that. And he's telling Natalie this story, and she's just standing there, uh, just enjoying the conversation that they're having together. And then the guy says, I was on duty on 9-11 downtown. <laughs> she couldn't believe it. She couldn't even read at 9-11. And here she goes. <laughs> she buys a t uh, breakfast for two strangers because they're police officers. 
I don't know what this guy's function that day was. She didn't go into all the details or anything like that. But here she is. She's buying these guys breakfast. And it's her day that gets completely turned around. This was a day for her that she'll never forget for the rest of her life. She met an American hero. And there are many out there. There are many unsung heroes out there. But I guarantee this guy to her was an American hero that she was too young to even know about at the time. Compassion is a boomerang. And it works all the time, constantly. You give compassion, God will give it back to you. Natalie will never, ever forget that day. It was the little things, the little things, like Ashley writing that poem and Natalie paying for that breakfast. Those are the things that God sets off. Those are the things that God rewards. Those are the things that we're going to answer for or our lack of when we go to heaven. Don't think that compassion involves something huge that you have to do. You have to pay off somebody's mortgage or you have to do this big thing or you have to build this person a house. Think little. Those are the everyday things that you need to keep in mind. And I made you a little list. And the first thing on the list was, how do, I, how do I come up with these ideas? I'll tell you exactly how this list was brought up. I searched, number one, I searched the internet for random acts of kindness ideas. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and I couldn't, I couldn't possibly read them all. I couldn't possibly read them all. So if you're hung up for ideas, let me tell you what, go to Google. Let me just pick a few that I chose, or read a few that I chose here. Pay for a person's meal behind you in the drive-up line. I see that on Facebook all the time. People are always writing and say, somebody did that for me, and then I did it for the next person. Compliment the first three people you talk to today. Compliment, compliment, compliment. Most of us have to keep that in mind because it's not natural to us. Compliment the first three people you sit, talk to today. Surprise a neighbor with freshly baked cookies. I love that one. <laughs> you don't want my cookies, but I sure like yours. <laughs> Hint, hint. Uh, um, leave quarters at the laundromat. We've done this before. You know, Nancy and I hadn't used a laundromat in years and years and years and years. But we did way back in the beginning, just like most of y'all. But Mandy's washer broke down, and she hadn't done laundry in a family of 10 for a week. And by the time we got there, we had a week's worth of laundry. So we started at, well, she started at like 8 o'clock in the morning at the laundry. Matt. And at 6 o'clock, we left to buy supper. Um, but anyway, by, by the end, we had this whole bunch of quarters that we had left over. So I went in there. I did, don't just leave quarters in the laundromat because somebody will think they're somebody else's and they'll never take them. Go up to somebody and say, you know what? I got all these quarters left. I'll never use them. You, I hope you can use them. And then walk out. It's a really cool idea. Smile at five strangers today. This is one that I love. Just 
random strangers go up and as you're passing them smile at them and here's the really cool thing about that if you put it in your mind that you're going to do that for five people today and you count off your five people tomorrow say I'm going to do it to ten people and then you're just going to lose count anyway so start doing it to everybody you see and here's the really cool part about smiling at people it's a boomerang it will come back and it will make your days better it will come back and it will make you feel good because normally we go through this life with the upside down frown but when we start going through this life with a smile on our face our days get better our days do we didn't set out to make our days better by smiling at the first five people but guess what now that I smile all the time my days are full of joy little thing it's a boomerang return shopping carts from the parking from a parking lot how many times you go into a parking lot and there's shopping carts all over the place hey guess what take 15 minutes and start collecting them you've seen how the guys and the gals do that it's pretty cool I saw one of those on Facebook too it, it came from out of uh, out of another state this woman was trying to teach her son some responsibilities so she took him to a parking lot and they collected carts I thought that was cool tape coins around a kid's parking lot uh, park the playground that's a pretty cool deal huh you will put some smiles on some faces I guarantee it welcome new neighbors with a gift inspire others emails Facebook text doesn't even have to be face to face inspire 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 listen listen and listen even when you can't fix it that's ever so important uh, I don't know what area of distress you're under right today it could be this end of the spectrum it could be all the way to this end of the spectrum but that doesn't mean I can fix it but I sure can give you a shoulder to cry on I sure can give you an ear to talk into here's a big one pray for the ability to recognize opportunities so many of us fly through life so fast it's a constant uh, I tell people that I haven't been able to get back with on the telephone I said these last two months have been perpetual motion for me well it's time for me to slow down because I'm passing up too much stuff when our life is perpetual motion and we're charging through it we don't have the opportunity to look for the little things the little opportunities that we have to make somebody else's day so much better talk the talk and walk the walk this is pretty simple and this is basically what compassion and Christianity is all about we don't have to preach Christianity we preach Christianity by who we are and the way we act and the way we talk and the things we do pay attention to my life not necessarily what I say but to things that I do pay other people will pay attention to your life to how you're living it to what you're doing and that's how Christianity spreads because in that they will see the compassion you do not have to be a Christian to have compassion many atheists have compassion many agnostics have compassion many of other religions have compassion but in order to be a Christian you have got to have compassion Amen